I'm happy here to, to introduce Eddie Satterley from uh, Splunk. He is their chief big data evangelist. Um, he's going to give a talk uh, to us today on big data architectures. Um, so let's give a warm welcome for Eddie. Thank you. So I like to start by being very controversial right off the bat. So to be definition of big data, there's about 8 billion of them out there. Most of them are just marketing. Uh, the real definition, in my opinion, is stuff that really doesn't fit the traditional relational model, uh, whether it's OLTP, analytics, whatever you want to call. It has nothing to do with big data, because lots of problems have nothing to do with data that's petabytes or all the other scales that you hear about. It's really about solving a problem that just doesn't fit, whether it's unstructured data or whether it's very heavy analytic workloads that relational databases just don't handle particularly well. So there's a lot of things out there. Um, this is kind of the real world one that I see. Um, when we talk about big data, there's basically a couple things that you should really look at quite seriously. I'll put my glasses back on. Um, one is that you gotta figure out what the problem is that you're actually trying to solve. Um, don't just make something work. Um, in many cases, and I talked to a whole lot of our customers, about 160 or so last year, um, and every time you talk to them, it's very interesting the answers you get when you ask them about what their issues they're working on. But it, most of them really boil down to, it's either an OLTP scalability issue, meaning we've outgrown what we can do with an existing relational database, or it has to do with a big analytics problem. Usually, that means I can't afford more of insert name of my data, data warehouse vendor here. Uh, whether it's Natiza, Vertica, whatever it happens to be, I just can't afford more to solve the problem I need to solve. So how do I do that? The other thing is more likely, and probably 60 or 70 percent of the customers I talk to, it's not really a big data problem at all. Um, it's either their engineering team wants to create value on their resume, so they do Hadoop, or it's because their CIO or somebody played golf with another CIO and heard well, we're doing this really cool big data thing and you should have it too, and then they come and, what's our big data strategy for the next five years? That happens a lot. Um, or it's some really industrious person found one problem that they needed something that didn't fit relational for, and they built this cool little test cluster, and everybody said, I wanna do that too. And they just start piling more and more things on top of it, even though it's maybe not the best fit for it. In my opinion, um, coming from a background of running architecture and engineering teams, the most important thing to do internally is to be a trusted advisor to the people within who are your internal constituents. And in order to really win that, you have to be able to pick the right tool for the right problem and not be afraid to recommend a solution that's maybe not what, you know, the CIO who played golf and heard that they should be doing MongoDB, you know, so we only need to solve all of our problems. When are we gonna get rid of SQL and replace everything with MongoDB? Right? You gotta be smart enough to say, yeah, if we do that, that's perfect for 1% you know, of our problem space where it's small clusters and it's all about document stores and nothing else and you're okay with storing everything in JSON. But where that isn't the case, what really is the right solution for the problem? There may be 50 things you have to evaluate to prove the point or you may be able to go to one nice piece of something out on Google and say, look, someone else in our industry has already done this and this is how it didn't work. Uh, but being able to think of it in a technical perspective, give a good answer and say, yes, I, it's great that we need to go do this and you know, Mongo will be great for this one thing, so let's go do that and then you can go tell all your friends you'd have Mongo too, but it's there for one solution where it fits. And quite honestly, I think the biggest problem that I see in a lot of organizations is um, they subscribe to Gardner and they listen to whatever they say or they've read some paper somewhere about how somebody solved the problem, whether it's LinkedIn or eBay or somebody, and we could all do it that way. The problem is that doesn't really work, and if you don't know the rest of the ecosystem, you don't know what the right solution to the right problem is. So knowing the ecosystem is key. I do a lot of these talks, and I love this slide. Everybody hates it usually, but I love it. So really, when you talk about big data technologies, the first, kind of problem that people tried to solve that didn't fit the traditional relational database paradigm was let's just shard our databases. Probably the worst possible solution you could take, but 
plenty of people did it. I mean, there's petabyte clusters out there of sharded databases of MySQL. I mean, sure, you can do it. The real next kind of jump that made a lot of publicity was Hadoop, and we'll just put everything in HDFS, and we'll do MapReduce across everything, and it'll solve every problem, and you know, it's all fixed. That doesn't really work either. Hadoop solves a lot of problems very well. Um, it's very well suited for a lot of use cases, but it doesn't solve every problem just like any solution. And then you have the, what I call the bastardized solutions, where people try to layer SQL on top of MapReduce or SQL with MapReduce on top of a distributed file system, and I've yet to find a problem that these solve very well. Um, it, it's a really cool buzzword, and there's a whole lot of publicity about it, but I don't know of a single one of the customers that I've talked to who's using a SQL MapReduce distributed file system framework that actually solves a problem for them. Um, the other space, and this is the, for the people who have the OLTP problems, there was a number of NoSQL solutions about two years ago. Uh, I was at a conference and they said there were 76. I think there's like 200 new startups doing NoSQL-ish stuff that have come up in the last year. But the ones that really I see out in the wild that do solve problems and that our people are doing stuff with, like Cassandra and then CouchDB and MongoDB, they solve very different problems, but they do solve the problem of, I have an a online transaction processing system and I need to make this scale bigger or I need to handle multi-data center, multi-master rights. And quite honestly, you can pay millions of dollars for licenses to some big red company um, and you can buy their licenses and you can do multi-master across multi-data centers on relational databases, except there's about 8 billion caveats to how that works. And it doesn't work very well in a geodiverse environment. These solutions work. I mean, personally, for my previous role, we had a Cassandra cluster on three different continents, 144 nodes. We were never more than four seconds out of sync. I mean, to me, that's proof. And then you have the real-time indexing space. Obviously, I work for one of these companies, but there's also Solar and a few others that are out there that do the real-time indexing piece. And it solves a problem where you have what people like to refer to as like a SEP problem or something like that, or CEP problem. Uh, most of the time, solutions like this are used to address those kind of issues. Um, there's plenty of new emerging technologies out there that are really, really interesting uh, to solve this without indexing, but um, there's still just playgrounds for now. So the need for new technologies, the wonderful relational database square peg that's been put in every single hole, no matter what shape it was in for a long time, 25 years-ish. But really, when you look at it and you start doing evaluations of your workloads and the type of access patterns and the types of data sets you want to put in, there are many, many reasons why relational databases fail miserably, not the least of which is the ETL problem and the bias of the person who writes the ETL or requests the ETL process to be made. And there's tons and tons of examples of this and how it has set back drastically uh, a lot of industry over time. Um, and really, when you look at it, the only real good excuse for having a relational database in an OLTP system anymore is if you have an asset compliance issue. If you don't need asset compliance for transaction type processing or from a compliance perspective within it, there's not really a good reason to use a relational <coughs> database over a NoSQL store anymore unless you just like to spend money. Um, so it's, I have every single group that I talk to, if you do a real evaluation, you find that you would be far better off to do something else. And for people who don't know what asset compliance is, uh, that's the four things that the acronym stands for. But it basically means that for a committed transaction, you have to be able to provide complete isolation and consistency across every transaction. So down to the atomic transaction level. It is required for a number of financial systems. Uh, very, very little besides that are there actual compliance reasons to have ACID outside of finance. Um, really the NoSQL space said, we don't really have to have ACID, we can decide how close we need to get to it based on our requirements, but we can trade off a little bit to get better scalability over uh, the standard relational side, as well as we may need to do something like, you know, write multi-master transactions on three continents, right? And 
quite honestly, the architecture from the place I came from with the their systems and the relational databases, you ended up having primary databases at multiple data centers and then doing sync masters and then moving the copies from the syncs over and then having to true up everything with a algorithm that did testing on stamps and various other things, which doesn't really work uh, when you have to start getting to very large transaction volumes. So if you look at the traditional application architecture stack, no, this is just the sample of an internet type application. What you end up having to do is build these big cache clusters to sit in front of databases to be able to synchronize caches between multiple sites. And you know, you've got the front end complexity load balancers, which you're not gonna get away from, but when you have to look at the back end, it's very painful to have to do master database at a single site and cache it or copies of databases and snapshot them and keep them up or transaction shipping if you can afford the Oracle solutions. So there are plenty of ways to solve this problem, but they're all either expensive or not very efficient. So first step, the sharding piece, talk about doing a relational databases, and this also carries forward in all of the NoSQL solutions that are out there. As the data grows, you add another similar node and you let the actual software, either the client software, meaning the application, and you put it on the developer, or the database software, meaning Mongo or Cassandra or Couch or whatever you're using, you allow them to decide how to shard your data based on some known key or hash or whatever you happen to use. Almost all of the NoSQL solutions that have survived the last couple years are auto sharding in some way, uh, whether it's Cassandra by hash or whether it's Mongo by common key. So in the NoSQL space, we talked about this really, but the NoSQL movement really grew out of frustration and I know a whole lot of these guys from out in the Bay Area that really started a lot of these movements. They were just tired of, well, Facebook was very clear about the fact they were quite tired of paying Oracle a lot of money. Uh, there's been plenty of other companies also in the, the Bay Area that were just talking about how they didn't wanna pay for something or that it was too expensive or the infrastructure was too expensive and they were trying to find a trade off. And this is where it came from. So. They were willing in most of those cases, you know, uh, the original Facebook use case for Cassandra was around the inbox store, um, but many others have similar stories that they came out of solving some problem where scalability or data typing didn't fit really a relational model or something. And nearly all NoSQL solutions solve for eventual consistency. There are a few uh, ones that don't, and we'll talk about that in a second with a the cap theorem. Um, in most cases, the NoSQL solutions are going to be far less uh, feature set rich than the SQL solutions. Now, it's because you don't need them in most cases, but they trade off things like data management, query optimization, transaction types. Uh, a lot of that stuff goes away when you move to NoSQL, but it's because it's assumed in the NoSQL solutions that you don't actually need it. Um, that's not always the case, and as you look at some of them, I mean, I, I'm pretty heavily involved in the Apache Cassandra project. So if you look at that one specifically, it's been determined that people actually do care about a lot of those things. So you had CQL2 and then people care about some different things and then you had CQL3 and they've continued to evolve the query language access types to handle some of these fuller, richer sets of data, you know, actually building sets for instance, um, which didn't exist before. Basically, in the majorities early on anyway, and it's starting to change again, like I said, with the newer evolving languages that are built around them or the new APIs or SDKs that are being built around them, where you've really left indexing or query optimization or access patterns or data modeling or whatever it is, is kind of left to the app developer to decide what's really important to them and then build the solution out that way. Uh, it's moving away a little bit from that and moving more towards of it being more feature rich, but you know that's because some of these are now in version two. When they, you know, I, I went to production with Cassandra version dot six, so it, it's changed substantially, and there's a lot less development effort that's needed to make it work. So the cap theorem, the really important thing: if anyone ever solves this problem, uh, they're going to retire to their own island. Um, it's a problem that's been around for a long time, and. So far, there's no way. You've got to pick two, right? It's very much, there's several things that build on this pyramid, but you have to pick, pick two of the three to decide where you want to land. Um, the 
relational databases picked theirs a long time ago, and now a lot of the NoSQL stores have, are deciding what camp they want to live in. And like I said, there's a couple hundred of them that have popped up in the last couple of years, so uh, they're all making very different decisions. Partition tolerance is the one that everybody seems to want to have for good reason, uh, but and that basically means that you can handle splits or you can handle a, a node going down or a lost message, something that comes out of, out of order. The consistency and availability one is where people tend to trade off. Um, a lot of the newer NoSQL stores are paying more attention to availability, availability across multiple zones because they're building an AWS and they need to be globally uh, divergent availability against different sets of nodes within a data center even. Those sort of things are fo the focus of many of the NoSQL solutions. The other side is the consistency piece. Um, obviously the people who want to get closer to the asset compliance side focus more on consistency, but the majority of them again tune away from consistency if you need better availability. You know, basically understanding that something is not going to work at some point, you need to be able to decide which two you want. So if you look at a layout, you know, your SQL solutions all end up on the consistent side. MongoDB is also focused primarily on consistency, whereas Cassandra and Couch and Marie and a whole bunch of other ones that exist out there, Vault, Redis, you name it, all focus more on the availability side and go less away from the consistent side. So they're all focusing on partition tolerance. It's just which side of the CNA they want to fall on. So for people who don't know what Cassandra is, um, it's a highly scalable, semi-structured database. Basically means it can handle high volume writes um, of all of the NoSQL stores. It's way up there in comparison to others on the amount of writes it can handle. Uh, what is more challenging is building your data model for reads to be efficient. Uh, reads are quite painful if you don't set your data up correctly up front. So it requires the same type of planning you've always had to do for relational databases if you want to be able to get the same kind of speed and access patterns. However, it is very fault tolerant. Like I said, we went to production originally in my last job with 24 nodes at dot six, went up to 144 nodes, three geo sites, and you know, that was on 1.0. So you can handle billions of transactions per second across the nodes and very, very high sub few millisecond uh, latency times. So how Cassandra works, Basically nodes organized into clusters. Clusters contain data and key spaces, which you can think of as a database instance in the traditional world or Splunk in the index if you're in the Splunk world. Then within each key space, there's column families. Column families are similar to tables, except that you don't have to have exclusive columns in every row. So the example off to the right, the row key has to be in every row because that's the hash component that you're using to look up the rows but the remainder of the columns may or may not be present. Now this can be enforced. There may be, you know, in a customer relationship database, you may want to enforce that they have first name and last name. Middle initial may be optional. So every row may have to have one or the other, but not the middle initial. Every row may have to have a phone number or you may require an email, but you, they all are optional whether they exist in a row. So you end up with a very ragged row configuration. So. I have customers that I work with that have large Cassandra uh, column families where they have you know, a, a required three uh, columns per row, but some rows may have 20, 30,000. Um, a lot of them are when they're doing sampling from sensors or um, devices that aren't gonna consistently send the same thing. You get a sensor reading from 40 different devices some of them sample every two milliseconds, some of them sample every five seconds, some of them sample every 20 minutes or twice a day. And you wanna put all those devices in one single column family, it's possible to do that in a Cassandra store. You will just have no values in the columns and no key value at all in the columns that don't have the readings at the granularity of the others. So it's very dynamic. You can enforce columns like I talked about, but in most cases, it's very dynamic for the columns. So why it's different, it's really the only NoSQL store that scales truly linearly. Um, it is not equaled in a database, relational or otherwise. Um, like I said, there are trade-offs to that because since you get the linear scale and the, the 
write capability reads become a little more challenging if you don't do it right up front. And I experienced this firsthand. It's very painful. Um, <clears throat> but they are extremely fast. Um, Netflix is very uh, vocal about their use of Cassandra, and they have a lot of uh, metrics out there. I have a couple sample in a second. but And they have a strong commercial backing. So you take that same internet application we talked about before. Now you've got a Cassandra ring that spans multiple data centers broken up into each of the different regions where you know A, B, and C are all different data centers. These can be, in the case of uh, my old application stack, they could be in Singapore, London, and Phoenix, but they could also be anywhere else in the world. And as long as you have connectivity between them and you can copy the stuff over, you're fine. If one site goes down, it'll eventually catch up. Um, you can resync things based on timestamps, so you always have the newest data when things come back up. So this is what the app would look like in that case. We also talked about Mongo. Uh, Mongo, again, very similar in the fault tolerance and scalability perspective. Um, it is designed to be a document store database, so everything is organized into a BSON or binary JSON document, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it requires structure, but structure only in the fact that it has to be in an object. It can be schemaless as well. So you've got kind of the trade-offs of relational structure, but unstructured messages within the structure. So it, it's a very interesting solution. I had a lot of success in using it in very small uh, clusters, meaning eight nodes or less, and you know a couple hundred megs of data. Uh, when you start talking about larger data sets, it still to date has some scalability issues. Um, they've been working on it a lot. The last couple versions have gotten considerably better, but when you have something like you know, a bank that updates you on periodic amounts of transfer rates to move currency between countries, you know, it's a very well understood type of document. It comes in at particular intervals and it doesn't have large burstable scale issues. It works beautifully. Um, it was the perfect solution for those kind of things. Um, I would not use it for you know, back into a web application today. Um, that is unless you understand the scale you're gonna grow to. Uh, if you look at the way the MongoDB data structures are set up, it's very different than what we talked about before. Again, this is going to be set up as collections, which are organizations of documents. Documents are mostly like rows inside of a table and collections are kind of like tables. Um, however, anything can be set inside of them. They're just built into a JSON document. So at the end of the day, these things could be any number of key value type um, objects of any sort, but they're built inside of an object which happens to be a JSON. Why it's different is because it really is the closest to asset compliance of the solutions that are being used in any kind of enterprise scale today. Um, it falls much closer uh, to the relational database side than it does Cassandra or Redis or Couch or any of the others. Um, it is a truly native JSON document store, so everything is in a JSON, whether you put it in that way or not, that's how it's gonna store the object. So for applications that need quick serialization, deserialization of objects, JSON's very good for that. So it works very, very well at high speeds for those kind of reads and write workloads. Again, it's auto sharding and has a strong commercial backer with the company that used to be Tengen that's now changed their name to Mongo, so it's people know who they are. Because it's interesting that a company called Tengen is responsible for MongoDB and nobody actually knows what that is. But they were smart and changed their name. So if you look at NoSQL performance, so this was talked about with Cassandra being the nice straight line going up in a linear fashion. So the more nodes you add, the more growth that you have in throughput ops per second, and it's truly linear. Um, other solutions, well, you notice that relational database MySQL is what they use because this is done from the very large database conference that's put on with a bunch of professors that test these workloads every year. Um, MySQL pretty much rides the line at the bottom because you have no scalability by more nodes. You only can store more data sets. And then you have other workloads in here. Uh, this particular year, they did not test uh, Mongo for the mixed workloads. It was tested the following year. I just don't have the charts because they didn't release them publicly. Um, but VoltDB, Redis, HBase. HBase is the closest to being able to get linear scale, but they're still uh, off a bit. 
this was this test was from two years ago, so things have changed a little. Uh, this is last year's Read Write, where they tested Cassandra, HBase, and Mongo. Um, endpoint benchmarking Read Write only, not mixed workload set. Um, so as you can see, HBase with a newer version has gotten closer to the Cassandra line, uh, although still mixed queries are there. You know, 8,400 compared to 33,000 at the node scale. So they're getting closer, but not there. So Hadoop, I know you guys are a, a decent size Hadoop shop, so I'm not gonna tell you a whole lot you don't know for a lot of you, but I'll do the quick summary real quick. Um, again, what a, the core of Hadoop really is, is it's about a distributed file system, HDFS and MapReduce, uh, which is an access paradigm. It is very, very flexible. It handles multiple data sets, but it's exactly kind of horizontally opposed to what NoSQL is built for. NoSQL is built for OLTP type workloads. It's built for very high performance read write switch off for things that handle the OLTP set. Hadoop was originally built to solve the opposite problem, which is we need to put a whole bunch of data out and crunch over a longer period of time to figure out what the answer to our question is. The lines are starting to blur a bit more. It's still pretty uh, divergent today, but it's very, very flexible system. You could, you don't, you're not restricted in any way by data types or data file types or locations or any of that. It's a complete uh, flexible file system. Uh, you can, it works in exactly the same way. And in most cases, companies now with the newer versions, I mean, it's just a big file store. So you can treat it like NFS if that's what you want to use it for. Um, it was designed to deploy on commodity hardware. Uh, depending on what vendor you talk to, some of them want to actually put it on SAN, which is an interesting product marketing perspective. But um, it is built strictly for directly attached storage on commodity nodes. Uh, there is no performance gain by putting it on other types of hardware, despite marketing. Um, and it is a open source platform that has tons now of, uh, there's more every couple months of distributions of people trying to sell their version. So the core components, um, this is a, I think it's about a six month old or eight month old um, set that was out on the Apache site for a while, but you have the kind of the core pieces, as I talked about before, Hadoop in the middle, which is really just the MapReduce and HDFS piece, and then all these other things around it whether it's uh, you know the nice names of Zookeeper, Uzi, or Flume, or Scoop, or Pig, or Hive, or whatever they happen to be, and they keep coming up with more and more interesting ones. Now we have Tez, because that one's kind of cool, and Impala, and we'll come up with more names, I'm sure. So uh, there, there is a very large ecosystem around Hadoop. It changes every single day. I mean, I, this is my job, and I can't keep up. Every day I go and look and Google something, I find some new Apache project that they're trying to do an integration direct to the Hadoop core. So why it's different, again, scales out to huge data sets, um, tens of petabytes in a number of customers, hundreds of petabytes in a couple, you know, 40,000 node cluster is the largest public one. Um, basically, the 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 access paradigm still to date, and Yarn, which is a new access paradigm, is trying to change this, but the access paradigm today is all built around MapReduce one way or another, or by putting structure on unstructured data. So you can build hive tables and do fun things like that, or you can force things into a structured format so that a SQL-like thing works. Um, I just find it interesting still, but um, you either basically have to force structure on it or you have to use the MapReduce paradigm. MapReduce is not the friendliest thing to use, um, for any of us who have actually had to do Java MapReduce, it's kind of like watching paint dry. Um, it's not the most fun thing to do, and quite honestly, I think when people talk about the fact that they can't find Hadoop developers, it's because they want them to do nothing but write Java MapReduce, and who in the hell would want that job? Um, it's like, to me, it's like the SQL developer, the poor guy who's done nothing but write select from something for the last 25 years of his life. That's a horrible, repetitive task. Why would you create another one of those? Um, so, you know, now people are getting the more interesting and creative ways to access the data set. Uh, again, shameless plug, but, you know, Splunk has their Hunk product, which is another way to access without having to do the MapReduce side yourself. We do it for you. Um, but there's a ton of other ones out there as well. And Yarn, ideally, with the evolution of Yarn and when things get a little more advanced in the Yarn space, 
you can basically mesh together a whole lot of things and use different data types and be able to kind of control the jobs without having to know the MapReduce side. And it makes people who've had to do MapReduce much, much happier. But if you really think about what Hadoop is, it's a giant pool of storage with primarily a batch-oriented interface to access the data sets. Now, there are plenty of other sub-projects that pile on top of it, HBase being a, uh, one of the NoSQL type solutions. And I can't wait till they release a version of HBase without a single point of failure, and then I can talk about it in my slide deck. Um, it's been promised for a couple versions. I know the JIRAs are being worked on, and I really hope the next version gets there. Um, the core part, parts of Hadoop, um, there's two types of nodes, master node, slave node. Master node has a name node process running on it, which holds all the metadata for access. There's a secondary name node process, and there's a job tracker process, which manages your MapReduce jobs. The slave nodes basically have the data components, which is the HDFS data block space, and then a task tracker, which handles the individual MapReduce tasks as they're sent down to the data nodes. It's a very simple thing to look at on a screen. It's very different when you have to run it. Um, again, we went to production well before 1.0 at my last job on Hadoop, and uh, it was horrible. Um, we, it was probably the second highest operational turnover group that we had in the company. Um, luckily, things have evolved quite rapidly, and it's gotten far better, and now it's a lot easier to run. But again, there's a lot of tools out there, depending on your um, version of choice and which distribution you use. Their tools are different, but pretty similar in the way that they help you manage things. So do really kind of three quick um, kind of use cases that I see in the wild, and then we'll open things up for questions and have a little more time to talk that way. Um, really one of the most successful Hadoop use cases that I see today, and this is, a, you know, we have 120 something customers that run Hadoop in production. Uh, that, that we've talked to, and of those, the majority of them are using this use case, which is trying to either get rid of a legacy data warehouse, augment it, and not have to buy any more because it's expensive, or companies who just couldn't afford a data warehouse before. So they had like 15 different SQL nodes running different places with historical replicas of different data sets, and then someone had to write these horrible joins between 40 different database servers to get the data out because they couldn't afford the actual data warehouse solutions. Um, this particular slides I stole from Teradata and Hortonworks because it's a very good picture, but it doesn't really matter which process you use. Um, they're using it basically to either offload ETL processes, get rid of the bias of an ETL process, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, but there are a number of companies who have found when they've gotten rid of that ETL bias that they found something really interesting in the data that they've had for as long as history existed, it's just been dropped on the floor in ETL into the data warehouse for years. Um, one of the companies that I have worked with several times on site with them, uh, they, they found about a $30 million, now that granted they're about a $50 billion company, but they found a $30 million optimization by literally just saying, okay, this used to be in, in like nine ETLs, we're gonna dump all the raw data into Hadoop and we're gonna start doing some analytics across. So they very quickly found out that they could save $30 million from their process. This is a direct off the, the cost, the cost of goods sold side of their business. They reduced the $30 million expenditure that they probably would have found 10 years earlier if they hadn't have been dropping all the stuff on the floor in the ETL process that they then found in the raw data. So, I mean, it's not always gonna be like that, but there are a lot of times when the bias or the filtering that's applied to the ETL drops that golden nugget on the floor on the way in and you don't know until you can see the raw data. And quite honestly, most of the analysts who look at the process data have no access to the raw data, let alone would know what to do it if they did. So if people have to build the stuff for them. Um, also, more and more data sources are being added today that don't fit the data warehouse model. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons that the Teradata and Natiza reference architectures exist today. I've heard there's a Vertigo one coming really soon too. But the reason these kind of hybrid model data lake slash data warehouse models exist out there or data hub if you're Cloudera. Um, the reason these models exist is because people have figured out I've got all this data and there's no way I could possibly crunch it down to fit into a relational database or into a data warehouse. 
I have to find some kind of hybrid approach. And rather than those big data warehouse vendors losing all of their market, they figure we'll cooperate with somebody else and we'll kind of join the market for the most optimized use case, which I think is awesome. Helps customers out quite a bit to not have to figure out how to do everything. Um, and the last thing is that people really want to be able to do ad hoc analysis. When you talk to people, more and more of your business analysts, your data analysts, your whatever analysts, want to be able to get at the raw data and figure out what they want to ask. They don't want to have to live with what's been going on for 25 years, which is, well, tell me what question you want answered, and then I'll go look at the data, and I'll tell you what data I have that might answer your question, and then if you agree, I'll build a process that'll load this data in over the next two months, and we'll start sampling it, and then you can look at it, and hopefully that's what you wanted, otherwise it's gonna take two more months to go back and redo this all over again. People don't wanna deal with that. Um, the, the newer generations of people are used to having access to every piece of data they want by typing something into Google or by going to their phone and logging into their favorite social network and finding out everything going on. They do not want to deal with a two month process to load the data in and hope that it's the right data you really wanted. They wanna be able to dig through it as quickly as possible, find what they think they want and go looking at it. And then if it's not what they want, they wanna be able to change it on the fly, not two months later. So this kind of, I need all the data at my fingertips right now thing is also driving a lot of these successful use cases. And like I said, this is a good 20% of the successful deployments in production of Hadoop that I've seen have been in this kind of model. So I'm gonna drill through all this animation because I hate animation. Um, there we go. So this is actually a, one of our customers. I helped them build some of this reference architecture work. I went out with them. They already were a Cassandra customer, hence the reason that they it went this way. They also had a number of relational databases. They have Oracle, they have MySQL, they have Sybase, they have uh, Postgres, something else. They have five different relational databases that live in their OLTP world. Plus they were already using Cassandra for some of their newer web applications. Uh, they're also a Splunk customer, again, shameless plug. Um, and they have all this nice business data over here from tons of different CRM systems, processing systems, ERP, everything that's flowing in in interesting ways. They also wanted to use a bunch of external data. So they had partners that they worked with uh, that were willing to provide them data, but they had no real way to get the data in and it didn't really fit putting it into a relational direct data warehouse approach for most of the data types because they didn't come in a really nice pretty package. They just got a blob of junk. Plus they also wanted to get well, at least they thought when they started this, they wanted to get the Twitter data and the Facebook data and everything else, so they paid a service to aggregate that for them. They decided not to find any value in that surprise, but they tried it. Uh, they also had a huge investment in their existing ETL uh, components that weren't working particularly well. So they ended, in this case, they actually went with Pentaho uh, to do ETL and scheduling to move data from both Cassandra and relational databases into their data warehouse. Uh, they are actually a Horton customer, hence the green colored Hadoop box. Um, and they basically moved all this data around everything at the end of the day that they wanted to do longer term analysis on ended up in their Hadoop or relational data warehouse mixed environment. Um, all the stuff that they were okay with rapid access to, you had some direct uh, people. You got these people up in the right who are your, I'll call them the SQL power users or the people who bring down your SQL cluster if you prefer. Uh, they're the people who you give direct access to the raw SQL, the data warehouse environments where they can run their own, you know, 45 right inner outer joins and bring down your cluster. Uh, they also had access to the BI tool of choice. And you had a lot of what I call the operational analysts, which, you know, they may be DevOps guys, they may be ops guys, they may be the people looking at marketing, but they need an operational view as well as an analyst view of the historical data. And they would either access you know, Splunk directly for an operational store piece, or they may access uh, the BI tool of choice. In this case, this company had about 30, uh, which I find very consistently across the, the world is that, I mean, they had Cognos, business objects. They also got the Pentano stuff because they bought the whole package. They had Teradata for one team. They used Excel for a lot of stuff. They had access databases, things were syncing off of. So if you talk about possible ways to access it, I think they owned every commercial product available, but if not, very close. Um, and it's amazing how often you see that in big enterprises because this team wants to see this view and they go out and buy a million dollar license and they want to see this view and they buy a million dollar license. 
and you've got like 40 enterprise licenses for different products that all do the same thing. Um, so this is a real world customer view of how their data flow works. We got one more we'll talk about real quick. So again, lots of nice Splunk data that fits well into the, the log piece of Splunk on the side. You have an application server space that in the middle there, the app server that's running a traditional uh, clustered cached database. So they're actually using memcache and a database solution. In their case, I believe they're my, who are MySQL, I think, or Postgres. Um, they have a more distributed architecture set where they're, they were actually using Mongo in this case. Or actually, this is Couch, I'm sorry. This is CouchDB. Um, they also had some newer apps that they were building for their customer portal and a few other things that they were using Cassandra on the back end. This was their data environment of choice. Um, the, it's just that the one in the middle of the app server with databases, they had about 300 of those. The rest of these are individual cluster implementations. Um, and then they were landing a whole bunch of data, which came from them again externally, as well as some data that came from some interesting internal sources. But they were landing data that didn't fit an app profile and didn't fit the traditional Splunk profile they were landing there. They also had some security video stuff that was going there and some other things. So at the end of the day, they had a little bit of everything again. They took the right approach, right? They solved the problem. It actually works very well for them. They're a multi-terabyte per day um, Splunk customer. I think they had about 100 nodes, 90-something nodes, I think, with Cassandra. They're a pretty significant couch customer. They also, as I said, had hundreds of SQL instances running throughout the company. And their Hadoop environment was just over two petabytes, I believe, or close to. So they had a lot of everything, but it was all working, solving the right problems in the right place. Uh, they have continued since I drew this, and this was uh, eight, 10 months ago. They've continued to migrate more and more stuff away from the traditional cache database cluster, uh, either to Couch or to Cassandra. So they've continued to move out of that middle tier as they offer new services and new apps. They're realizing that they can get better performance and price for performance on the newer NoSQL solutions than they can on traditional relational databases. So they've continued to evolve and move. But this is yet another one of the many customers who've had a lot of success in this space. So that's the last of the presentation part. So I will open it up to questions. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just bury everybody and nobody actually wants to ask me a question now? I'll, uh, I'll ask the question here. Okay. So what would you consider big data to be? Because a lot of people may think they have big data, but I suspect that perhaps that's not the case. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, like on the first slide, right? I, I think big data is a silly marketing term, but I think when there's a big data problem, it usually ends up being I, data that doesn't work in a relational store or something that has a computational workload for analytics that's higher than what you can handle in a database. And I've seen plenty of people bury even the highest end relational databases on multi hundred thousand dollar servers with tons of memory and disk bury a database by trying to do analytics over a larger data set or across multiple data sets or huge joins. So it's the stuff that doesn't fit in my opinion. And plenty of people argue with me on that, which is awesome. You should watch me do a panel sometimes. I argue with everybody on the panel. <laughs> um. Uh, we have like uh, right now the, there are like huge data which is already uh, I mean it is uh, uh, there in the uh, the RDBMS Oracle or DB2 uh, which is like a huge size. How can we uh, use big data in such a case? I mean the existing huge data which is there in the RDBMS. I mean will uh, the Hadoop uh, will help in such a scenario? How we can leverage Hadoop? Yeah, I think if you're generally gonna to try to be successful with that approach, the way to do it is to stand up the new Hadoop infrastructure, start moving the raw data sets out of your multi-step ETL that it probably is in today to get to DB2. Start moving that data slowly as it makes sense over to Hadoop and leaving it as kind of a staging. I don't know how your data warehouse is built. Many people do it differently, but a lot of the people that are having success in this space are creating a staging environment, which ends up being Hadoop. So you can get to the raw data in staging and then they ETL out of there to make sure their existing processes don't break. Because lots of people, you know, if they don't get their Monday, Wednesday, Friday report, their life is over. So you don't want to break that. But just kind of injecting this 
staging area in the middle that's no longer DB2. And I came from a world that was all ISAS clusters, so I get DB2. And we moved, personally, we moved to a staging area. We dumped everything into Hadoop and staging, and we still kept ETLing all the stuff that people had to see their Cognos report. But the rest of it, we started moving around. So it's kind of an iterative process to keep from making people unhappy. But the quickest way is stand them up parallel and start using it as a landing on your way in and then slowly deprecate the data warehouse stuff that doesn't belong there or that doesn't fit well. And uh, one more question. What is this yarn? yarn? So yarn, yarn is, a, yarn is a, a, Apache Yarn is a new access paradigm. It was, it was a concept that came out of Hortonworks. Uh, I think there's actually a couple other committers, non-Hortonworks now. Originally, it was just a Hortonworks committer project. Um, but it, it's a new access paradigm that basically becomes a workload management. So you submit jobs to Yarn. It can manage map reduce one or map reduce two, or it can use other access patterns depending on as people write new ones for them. There's five or six Yarn applications exist out there today. Quite honestly, they're all kind of crap. But it's starting down the path of letting you do it in a way that isn't a raw MapReduce access. Because MapReduce is freaking hard. No, is it a wrapper around the peak or hive or, I mean? Um, no, it's designed to, to sit on top of the cluster as the management interface. So it becomes the access management or the workload management piece. Um, I think longer term, the view is, you know, as you take Hive, you, Project Stinger, which is not a product, by the way, despite Mr. Olson's blog. Uh, project Stinger was a Hive project to enhance and get Hive to a newer version that actually works well for most workloads. Um, so that project has something piled on top of it, which is called Apache Tez, which is an access pattern through Hive. Tez is a Yarn compatible application. So the idea is to continue to build these things on top of the other access patterns and let the workloads be managed via something and that's what Yarn was built for. Thank you. So as you probably know, we're pretty entrenched, or, or may not know, pretty entrenched in the uh, relational database side here at Cerner. Most people are. Yeah. And as my team is finding out, trying to scale out horizontally is extremely difficult, especially across remote data centers. And I guess what I'm looking at is, I don't see that changing overnight, obviously, because you've got to get the knowledge in here, you've got to get the experience and so forth. But my question revolves around creating that, something like Cassandra or another type of NoSQL database. How does it relate with respect to operational complexity, management, deployment, and so forth, um, as opposed to, say, a relational database like Oracle? Sure. Um, so they're almost, the whole world you know, has suffered through 25 years of relational database being the only peg for the holes. So, I mean, it's entrenched everywhere you go. Um, and it's not, it's not bad for some of the solutions, but it's been forced into everything, so now you gotta get out of it. Um, I, again, I went to production with .6 at Cassandra. Um, I would suggest jumping off the building first. But um, post 1.0, uh, it, it's much, much better. And you know we're now at 2.0 for Cassandra. Um, as far as operational perspective, there are a number of large companies uh, that are running huge clusters, and Netflix is very public about it. You can look up their operational use case, all the Chaos Monkey stuff they built. Um, it, it takes a team of two people at Netflix, right? And they have some of the largest distributed multi-geo AWS Cassandra clusters in the world. They, they're the third or fourth largest single cluster in the world, uh, and they run it with a couple guys. So Cassandra really is just as easy to manage now as a relational database. The problems for Cassandra, and I'll be very honest, and it's true of all the NoSQL solutions, is you have to know your access pa paradigms up front, and you have to design the data model around how you're gonna use the data. It is still quite painful, and there's supposedly a visual builder that's coming and a bunch of other stuff, and you know there's JIRAs for it, so I'm sure it'll happen eventually. It's like all open source stuff. but. It, it takes a trained expert to be able to design your data models properly. Um, if you really wanna look at the Cassandra stuff, Patrick McFadden, who is the chief evangelist for uh, DataStax, the commercial entity behind Cassandra support, has a lot of really interesting 
uh, presentations on data modeling. He has a presentation called The Next Top Data Model, which is phenomenal about how the pains and trials you go through for that. So finding the expertise to look at the data you have, what access patterns will be there, and design your data models up front is really where the pain will be operationally. Once the clusters are up, they're very easy to handle. I mean, we had like a third of our cluster down for four or five days, no one even noticed. We, performance wise, we didn't have any issues because you always build redundancy in for DR and all that. So, I mean, in our environment, we had major nodes going down and it took days for people to notice. Um, so that's because you didn't have a management tool back then. Now you do. So you can see everything's red, yellow, green. It's very pretty on a nice ring. Um, so operationally easy building the data models and figuring out how to import data sets that exist today already and keep consistency among those as well as building new applications to handle it. It's problems. Okay, so one more question. You still have a question in front? Somebody down front? Oh. This guy down front too. Uh, hello. Oh. I'll answer the other one in a second because he's had his hand up for a while. <laughs> okay, um, I was just looking for any recommendations on how to keep up on the latest cool thing in big data architecture, like a short list of forums to watch. Uh, well, there's about 50 new forums every day. Um, there, there's a LinkedIn group, Big Data Analytics, which is really good. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that gets posted out there pretty regularly. Um, as far as the rest, I mean, it, stuff's changes so quick. I mean, it's my job and I seriously can't keep up. And this is all I do. So it's, well, I guess it's not all I do, but um, it's most of what I do. Um, so it's very difficult. I mean, just you gotta watch a lot of blogs, you gotta do a lot of searches and look at what's out there. Ignore half of what, anything looks marketing, just skip to the next one, because it's probably a lie. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of LinkedIn groups that are really good. If you look at my LinkedIn, you'll see what groups I'm in, join some of those. I mean, the big data groups that are there is where I find most of the stuff that's brand new or just coming out of stealth or whatever, where somebody goes out and brags about how cool their stuff is. Thank you. Yep. Um, do the last one. Uh, so my question is like, uh, if if you like had to di uh, distinguish like between which database to go, which NoSQL database to go with, like uh, whether we should go with Cassandra, MongoDB, or CouchDB, like uh, how how will we choose uh, those things? And let's say if uh, if we move with one of them, and like uh, half the way we come to know, like you know, we have to we. I mean, the other one was, you know, much more fitted for our needs, like how, how to do that transition and all. Yeah, so the transition's painful, so hopefully you don't go there. Um, for me, when I look at anything, it's a, if, if I know that I'm coming in with a preset document and I wanna really arrange documents in a document store, and I know they're not gonna be huge, and I'm not gonna need to scale over eight, 12 nodes, um, I think the document structure alone, if, the, if things are coming in that way, makes Mongo a perfect fit. If it isn't a document on the way in, and you know you might scale over eight, 12 nodes, depending on sizing, don't go Mongo, because you will pay drastically for that. Um, I corrupted an entire data store in production. It was a horrible weekend. Um, uh, I, I would say, if you know you need high volume writes, and you can handle slightly more latency on reads, because it's a high transaction system. I mean, by billions of transactions and you have disparate data sources, I think that's where Cassandra shines. If you're not sure what you wanna do, Couch is a great jack of all trade solution. I mean, it works moderately well in almost everything. It's just not great in any one particular use case. So if you are on the fence and can't figure out what you wanna do and you're not really sure what your data typing is, Couch is a good place to start and I would prototype it out and figure out if that really works for you. Um, definitely build stuff in dev and play with it because you will quickly break it if it's not the right fit. Um, you should never ever go to production with something um, that you haven't already proved will fail. Um, and how you make it fail is fine, but I mean, that's kind of the point of the exercise. But I, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag and it really depends on your use case. But let's say, like, uh, 
I write some test and um, let's say I choose CouchDB at first and it was showing like all the traits that, I mean like all the things that I wanted. But um, now down the line, my data all of a sudden like, you know, grew up and I had more users than I expected and all those stuff like. Uh, so, so at that point, like uh, how do you, or like how do you manage that situation or like do you just transition? It's very painful. I mean, you, you build your new cluster the new way and figure out what your new solution is going to be, and then you have to migrate your data sets much the way that, you know, you, you thought you understood your table structures, and then all of a sudden your keys all had to change in a database, and all of a sudden you have to redo your entire table structures to make sure you have the right key or indexes and keys. Uh, it's the same kind of pain. It will be horrible for you, and you'd like to avoid it if you can, so every possible access pattern and scenario you can think of ahead of time to test against, just beat the hell out of it and see if you can break it to see if maybe another solution would be better. Or, you know, if you have a specific use case in mind, there's a number of forums out there, just email me. I'll hook you to the right people. I mean, I'm not the expert on everything, but I'll hook you to the right people that can help you decide what the better solution is. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you.